Hello Legion, this is Hadrian. Thank you for being here and welcome to a revamped Survival School series in Hinterland Studios, The Long Dark. This is going to be a new player's guide and tutorial series, much like the one I did during Early Access in 2017. Episodes will be daily, each around 25 to 30 minutes apiece at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. And while the series is geared towards new players from 2018 and beyond, it's really for anyone looking to get better acquainted with the core gameplay mechanics of The Long Dark. I say mechanics because I'm going to go out of my way not to spoil the new player experience for all of you. If you are new to the game, you should be careful consuming really any kind of let's play, self-help, map, or tutorial content, because immersing yourself in a sense of solo exploration and discovery is essential to fully experiencing The Long Dark. But for those who would like a helping hand anyway, I'm here to help you earn your deerskin boots and pants. So this series is going to be showing you how to play, not where to go or what to do, how to survive your first 10 days, not how to survive your first 100. You'll see more of what I mean in about 10 seconds when we jump in. Just like last time, no one should hesitate to ask a question or offer an alternative point of view in the comments section. Hinterland's community and the channel's Long Dark community are as passionate and willing to help you as I am, so if you want to get the most out of watching this series, jump into the comments section when you're done with each video. Whether you're watching the video when it first comes out or watching it a year later, there's going to be a lot of good stuff down there. So, let's get started. This, of course, is the first screen that you see when you want to start a new game in survival mode, or sandbox mode, really, if you want to call it that. I want to take a second just to go over what each of the difficulty settings mean and what we're going to be playing on and why. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more, I'm not going to go into this much detail, but you can go to the custom difficulty settings and actually see what each of these various difficulty modes are like in terms of the very specific settings that exist. So you can do that if you would like to learn a little bit more about what each mode does to you. But in general, let me give you a quick crash course and talk about why we're going to be playing on Voyager. Voyager is actually the default difficulty level for the game. It's what the game was originally released on. Now, there were some early days where I, I think the Long Dark in its early development kind of felt like more of a mix between Voyager and Stalker. It might have even been full-blown Stalker at first. This was before difficulty levels even existed. Uh, when they added difficulty levels, Voyager was introduced as the default, and I really recommend this for most new players, especially if you are not an experienced survival player in any way, because it is the best balance between enjoyment and challenge. You will be able to really immerse yourself in the world and really appreciate and experience the beauty of the long dark and the the fun of the exploration but at the same time you'll feel the intensity you will feel the pressure of trying to survive especially once you start running out of resources from things that, from places that you've scavenged and you have you have to start hunting to survive you will feel that pressure in voyager but it won't be too intense so when you're first learning the game this is a great place to jump in if you feel like you are an experienced gamer especially if you played a lot of survival games go ahead and jump in at stalker know that stalker is going to be less forgiving <laughs> than Voyager, but it's really just tuned up pretty proportionately in terms of difficulty. The weather's a little bit harsher, uh, it gets colder a little bit faster, there are more animals, the animals are a little bit more vicious, and it, it, you just you need to be prepared if you're going to jump in on Stalker. But if you feel confident, then I will not say not to start on Stalker. Pilgrim is what I like to call, I think I called it in the 2017 Survival School Therapy Difficulty Mode. <laughs> As you can see from the description here, uh, wildlife will not even attack you unless provoked. So the thing about pilgrim mode is it's a great mode when you really, you want to go for that experience, that enjoyment, that exploration of the beauty that I was just mentioning. When you really feel like that's what you're going for in a particular session, I have played on pilgrim mode a couple of times just to relax. It's not challenging really at all, because again, the wildlife uh, will not attack you unless provoked. And if you understand the basics of the game and you're trying, you'll be okay. But that's, it. again, it can be very therapeutic. So it's it's good for people who maybe, if you don't feel like an experienced gamer at all, and you've never played a survival game, and you really want the game to take it easy on you while you figure things out, Pilgrim can be a good place to start. But most of you, I would say, Voyager. And that's where we're going to start uh, with this series, just to kind of have a baseline experience. I typically play on Stalker or Custom. I've done a few Interloper runs on YouTube as well. Um, Interloper is an interesting case. I have to say about Interloper really quickly, do not start on Interloper, even if you think you can handle it. I know some of you think you're hardcore <laughs> and you want to jump in and just and just beat the game on the highest level right away. I'm not saying that you can't do that. I'm not telling you you're not capable or that that's like somehow a stupid decision um, from a from a challenge point of view. It would be very challenging and fun. But the thing is, what I loved about Interloper when I first played it, they didn't add it right away. It's a newer difficulty level, and Interloper 
is a great mode to play once you have mastered the game on Voyager and Stalker. Once you really feel comfortable surviving for 50 to 100 or more days on Stalker, the really great thing about Interloper is that you jump in Interloper having played the game and having really enjoyed it and felt like you've, you've got a handle on it, you know what you're doing, Interloper makes it feel like it did on day one again. It really does. So if you jump in Interloper right away, you almost don't get the double enjoyment experience that the rest of us did by playing Interloper after we'd already you know, mastered Voyager and Stalker. So if you want to go ahead, but don't say I didn't warn you. Um, just, yeah, <laughs> I would recommend starting on Voyager or Stalker. Let's go ahead and confirm that we are. I thought a lot about where I was going to play this. I played on Mystery Lake for the first survival school. We're going to play on Mystery Lake again. Mystery Lake was the very first zone in the long dark. And I toyed with the idea of doing Coastal Highway, which was the second zone they ever released. And it neighbors Mystery Lake. It would provide kind of a, a mix up from the first series. But what I realized is that Coastal Highway is a much larger zone. I did a little bit of play testing. It's less guaranteed that you will find certain things um, quickly and that you can get around the zone as quickly. It's a little bit uh, more... It's not more chaotic, but it's just, it, it's got a different feel to it. And for a tutorial series, Mystery Lake is a perfect zone because it's a small zone. Uh, you can get around to a bunch of different types of environments relatively quickly. And that's, I think, the best place to do a survival school series. We're going to play on Mystery Lake. But of course, you can pick any of the zones in the game that you would like. You can also go ahead and go for a random region. And there might be, by the time you're watching this, there might be more than just the zones you see here. Hopefully there will be. I look forward to them continuing to expand the world. The newest zone is, of course... As we like to call it on the channel, Milton slash Mountain Town slash Milton. <laughs> if you play story mode and know what they call it in story mode versus survival mode, you'll understand. So we're going to jump into Mystery Lake. We're going to play as the male survivor. Quick fun fact for those of you who are new to the game and might not know this, but if you are familiar with voice actors, uh, especially if you're familiar with the Mass Effect series, but these these actors are both famous for more than just Mass Effect. Uh, the pair of voice actors that voiced uh, the male and female Commander Shepard in Mass Effect uh, are at play here. Uh, they not only star in the story mode, uh, but they do uh, the voices for the generic NPC survivors here. So, Or not NPCs, but the generic anonymous survivors. So the male survivor is played by Mark Muir, and the female survivor is played by Jennifer Hale. Not Hill, Hale, H-A-L-E. Some people get that confused when I say it. But uh, we're going to play as Mark Mir for this one. We're going to confirm that. And last but not least, you can activate feats. Of course, they reset progress on all these when we uh, went to launch, so I've only earned one. But uh, depending on the difficulty mode that you're playing, you can activate a certain number of feats, which give you buffs based on your overall uh, playtime across all of your playthroughs in the long dark, which are pretty cool. Like, I've got free running here, so obviously we can burn fewer calories when sprinting. Anyway, that's more of an experience thing. We're not going to activate any feats. Let's confirm. And we're going to call this, of course, Survival School. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. Charles Darwin. So, we have started off in a windy mystery lake and also looking like somewhat uh, foggy. And that actually is an interesting point to start off on. Like I mentioned in the opening of the first Survival School series, when you start a brand new game of The Long Dark, you will always start... Oh yeah, definitely foggy. Less windy, more foggy. You'll definitely start at a random location and a random time of day. When you play on lower difficulty settings like um, Voyager, like we're playing on, and Pilgrim as well, you have the chance... Not a guarantee, but the chance that you will also start indoors, possibly. But most of the time that you play The Long Dark, you will start outside. So really, your first objective when you start a new playthrough, uh, of course you have to get your bearings if you already kind of know where you are. You're not going to be able to get your bearings if you're completely new to the map. But your first objective is to start scavenging. And your second objective, uh, more specifically, more pointedly, scavenging is kind of a general directive. But much more specifically, you want to go ahead and find shelter. Before I do that, though, I want to go ahead and talk about... Actually, I think I know exactly where we are. So um, I know where I'm going to go in just a second. But... I want to take a second just to talk about the interface of the Long Dark and how to read the survival meters, because this is one of the first lessons that a brand new player of the Long Dark really needs to understand, especially if they're not as much into survival games. When you hold down the tab key on the computer, 
Or, by the way, uh, if you're using the Xbox, it's the menu button. So the button with three lines on it on the right side of the middle of the controller. Uh, you can pull up this little screen here. Now, you can move around while this is pulled up, just like I'm doing right now, which is nice because you can glance at it anytime you want, and it will fade away the moment you stop holding down that key. But um, this is what's called the survival panel. And this is going to show you not only, of course, the time of day. So it's past noon. We're in the afternoon at this point. Uh, probably have about four or five hours of daylight left before it gets completely dark, maybe six hours before it's completely dark. And then we have our condition meter on the bottom left, and then our status indicators, which are at the bottom middle of the screen. So we have how cold we are, how tired we are, how thirsty we are, and how hungry we are. Now, you might be asking yourself, oh gosh, do I have to make sure I keep all of those full? The answer to your question is no, you do not. You don't even have to keep all of them above empty. As a matter of fact, your life is not even in danger. It doesn't even begin to be in danger, really, in most instances, unless you get attacked by a very, very powerful wild animal, like an Aurora intensified bear, which is a thing. Your life is not in danger until that meter in the bottom left, your condition meter, is actually at 0%. Well, your life isn't in danger at 0%. You're dead. But the point is, that's your life bar down there at the bottom. I'm going to hit the F key for the computer. I don't know what key on the Xbox or PS4 um, pulls this screen up. So you guys let me know in the comments. But uh, when you hit the F key, you can actually see I'm at 100% condition. I have 1930 calories slowly ticking downward. We're slowly losing all of our status indicators. But it's very important to understand that one of the gameplay principles of the long dark is taking calculated risks. So you might sometimes have a completely empty warmth meter. You have hypothermia risk when that happens. Uh, you're getting colder and colder and you can't stay outside for long at that point because you will start losing a lot of condition. As soon as any of these are empty and some have more of a severe effect than others, any of these four are empty. This will start emptying out finally. So your life doesn't actually start being in danger until one of these is empty, and then you need to start worrying about, okay, maybe I need to fill that back up a little bit. And again, there's a calculated risk aspect to that because you might not have the supplies to do it. You might have to go a while being hungry or thirsty. Thirst, of course, will kill you faster than hunger. Exhaustion doesn't really kill you directly. It just makes it difficult to aim. It makes it difficult to uh, carry as much because your ability to carry your full weight load that you normally can when you're fully rested or more than half rested, which is the rule, is affected by how encumbered you are. The second you are less than 50% rested and you see this line go below the corners of the eyes, you're going to start seeing less and less uh, carrying capacity. And you're carrying the same amount, but you'll notice your character will slow down. That doesn't kill you as directly as something like thirst or hunger. But um, again, any of those empty out, that's when you'll have to worry about your character's life. And we'll talk more about afflictions and what those mean later in the episode and, of course, later in the series. But um, that's just a basic introduction to how the interface works. If you have any questions about that and about how the meters kind of indicate your condition, that's just a basic primer. We'll talk more about it as we play through. But again, don't worry if one of these empties out. You can actually get away with having these empty for long periods of time as long as you feel like you can get to shelter and resolve that situation before that situation, before that particular meter kills you. Because again, once your thirst is empty, once your hunger is empty, then you're going to start seeing condition drop slowly but surely, or in some cases, quickly, especially if you have all four of them emptied out at once. So, as I said, when you start a new game of the Lawn Dark, you should be scavenging. And you should be scavenging a lot. One of the first things you'll see on the ground most likely when you start walking around are sticks, or stones for that matter. Stones are a new addition to the game. One of the reasons I decided to do, one of the reasons I decided to do a new Survival School series is that so many substantial big updates dropped right after the first one came out. So there's a lot of new content to cover. Um, notice that this is a branch, so breaking it down will give me three six. It will take 38 of my 1800, 1865 calories to, uh, to break this down. I want you to notice something though. 10 minutes, okay? That's how much time it'll take to break that down. I'm gonna break this down and watch what happens. Actually, it's not that bad. We started with some decent clothing, so that wasn't a good demonstration. But what I was going to try and demonstrate with that is that when you're breaking stuff down out in the open, don't underestimate how much your condition can drop, especially coldness. Uh, if it's if you're in a blizzard, uh, if the temperature is very low, or if your clothing just is crap, um, even though that's just a 10 minute breakdown time, or if you're breaking down something or doing any activity that takes more than 10 minutes, um, that's like this, where it's it's something that's an automated process and it takes you away from the game for a second and fast forwards time. Understand that your condition and situation can change very quickly. 
a great example of that is when you maybe have a campfire set somewhere in the wild and you, um, you say to yourself, oh, well, you know, I've got this book here that I'm going to read for a bit and to increase my skill in, say, cooking. And you say, I'm going to read for two hours. I got plenty of time on this fire. Well, during those two hours, which are, which are fast forwarded by the game, and you can cut them off anytime you want. You can hit escape. But the point is, during those two hours, all of a sudden, a blizzard starts. <laughs> uh, not exactly a fun situation to be in. So actually, we are not where I thought I was. Fun times. That's a good way to start off a series in the long dark, having no idea where you are. So give me a second and I will get my bearings. One of the things that I want to do with this series, and I mentioned this in Survival School 2017 as well, and I kind of hinted at this in the introduction, and I told you that I would say more about what I meant by this. Um, we're in Mystery Lake. It's the original zone. It's the one that people are most likely to be familiar with, because again, I don't want to be spoilerific with this series. But, um, okay, I know where we are. But another thing that I want to make sure you're aware of is that I am not going to be really talking in this playthrough about how to get from place to place, where I'm going or how I'm navigating Mystery Lake even. I am definitely not going to point out where the transition zones from Mystery Lake are because I don't want to take away from that aspect of exploration and discovery that you get to have for yourself. So yes, we are in Mystery Lake. There's a reason we're playing in this zone on the difficulty we're playing on. And that's just to give everyone a good introduction to the game. So I hope that makes sense. I think it was a good approach in the original survival school. Let's see what's in this backpack. Hey, a rifle cartridge. So when you're picking up a man-made item, you'll get some information from the game, the condition of the item, how much it weighs, and what type of item it is. That's indicated by the icon above rifle cartridge. And of course, you can see your overall encumbrance down there on the bottom left. Again, at the very beginning, there's nothing you shouldn't be picking up. Nothing. I mean, I, you saw my, my encumbrance, right? I'm at 14.56 of 66 pounds. So pick up everything you see. You don't have to do inventory management yet. Don't be stingy. <laughs> I guarantee you, um, you will probably need most of what you pick up in the initial moments of your run. And it is foggy. Holy crap. See, this is when the long dark gets fun. Because when you're brand new and you don't know where you're going, you're just kind of stumbling through the fog like this, somewhat terrified, not sure what you're going to find or not sure whether or not a bear is going to loom out of the fog in front of you or a house that you can take shelter in. You, you don't know. And that's one of the truly magical things about being brand new to this game. And it's one of the reasons that I really envy people that are playing it for the first time, even in 2018, because um, there's nothing like I've said this so many times on the channel, but for those of you hearing me say it for the first time, there is nothing like playing this game when you have no idea where you're going and you have to stumble your way through the fog and through the blizzards and through the dark to find the next place that you can scavenge for supplies and the next place that you can hide from the cold. It is simply amazing. And that's one of the reasons, again, that I have decided to play the series the way I'm playing it. So we're not going to do too much... Here's how you get from point to point to point. I'm just going to kind of make my way around Mystery Lake without talking about pathfinding too, too much. Oh, hey, here's a uh, crowbar. Pry bar, rather, or crowbar, whatever you want to call it. But it's a uh, always a good item to start with, 100% condition as well. So that'll help us pry open any locked lockers that we find. Let me spend another moment looking around. We started out with some pretty decent clothing because we are not... I noticed we have a, um, a shell on, which is a good wind protection item. I'll talk to you more about the clothing system in just a moment. Ooh, rose hips. I'll definitely talk about these later, too. These are harvestable plants. Uh, we'll dedicate probably at least half an episode to harvestable plants later on. But um, you can definitely get some good benefits out of the naturally growing things that you find in the world. There's a fire log. It's the best wood that you can find as far as a single wood item, but it's heavy as hell. Hey, trail boots. All right, so we found our first clothing item. And we can talk more about the properties of clothing in a second. But the first thing I want to do is go ahead and get inside. And we will talk about the inventory system now that we've talked a little bit about the, um, the survival panel. And by the way, speaking of the survival panel, that is, of course, in the upper right corner. That's a, you know, a sundial that basically shows you roughly how much time is left in the day. Now, I would imagine we probably have about two hours left in the actual daytime. Maybe, like I said, three or four hours left of daylight. But the moon will start coming up in a second, indicating that the 
day is almost over, um, indicating that the, the, the night is on its way. And you'll definitely see the light changing in the world as well. So let's have a look around here. Again, full-blown scavenging mode. Another thing I'll tell you early on when it comes to scavenging, especially scavenging interior locations, it's not as bad about it's not it's not as bad in the outdoors, although it depends on how you look at it, I guess. Um, never, ever, ever, ever underestimate this game's ability and desire <laughs> to hide things from you in the weirdest of places. I can break down that crate, by the way, if I wanted to get some reclaimed wood. I don't need any right now, but I have that option. I could also break down the shelf if I had a hatchet. But never, ever, ever underestimate when you're scavenging for items um, the possibility... What was that? Deer? Yeah, probably a deer. Never underestimate the possibility that there are items hiding underneath some tiny little corner. See, this is kind of hidden, but that's a little bit more obvious because I saw it as soon as I walked in. Really take your time when you're in interior locations to look around and see what the game... Nice, thick wool sweater. That's a good early game find. And see what the game might be hiding from you in all of its nooks and crannies. There's a simple toolkit. Very nice. Simple tools, usable for basic crafting and repair. I'll show you more about that later on. There's a chair that we can break down. I think this chair, yeah. Some chairs can be broken down by hand, some can't. Depends on the chair. There's some cloth. Very good. We're going to go ahead and scavenge all three of these huts. Okay, we've got some beef jerky and orange soda. When you pick up food items, if I find another one, I'll show you. Actually, even better, I'll just go ahead, I'll drop the beef jerky and pick it back up again. So it tells you this restores 350 calories. It's at 36% condition. What does that mean for survival? You might wonder. I'll talk about that in a little bit once we have to tend to some of our needs. But for now, I, uh, you know, like I said, I, we're, we're good on our, on our meters. I'm not worried about topping off any of those at the moment. And there's a can opener. Also a very good early game find. Very common early game find. I would say even on Stalker. Once you get up to, say, Interloper... Uh, can openers exist, but uh, <laughs> they're a little bit tougher to find. Basically, anytime you're playing on a game with low standard uh, difficulty, or low standard, um, not difficulty, but uh, item availability in the world, I think Stalker has medium, and then Voyager has high, and Pilgrim either also has high or very high. I don't remember if there's a very high setting, but the point is that things get less and less uh, easy to find in terms of can openers and helpful items like that the farther you go. Okay, we got some jeans. So we're finding lots of clothing items to start out, which will be great for discussing the clothing interface in a bit. Antiseptic. Antiseptic is a wonderful thing to have. Notice how heavy it is. 1.54 pounds for one thing of antiseptic. I mean, good lord. It's ridiculous how heavy these bottles are. I did go through that drawer, right? Yes, I did. Always good to double check. Especially when you're <laughs> commentating and playing at the same time. Insulated boots. Hey, that's a nice find, too. Okay, we've got an energy bar there. And let's check this metal container. More antiseptic and another decent wool toque. There are two slots on your character's head, so you can definitely take advantage of both of those toques that I've found so far, which is quite nice. And no, it's not toque way. It's not toque. T-O-Q-U-E is pronounced. Toque, I assure you. Just trust me on this one. So, <laughs> if you take one thing away from this episode, it's how to pronounce Duke correctly. So, uh, that being said, let's now talk about the inventory system. Before I even do that, if you're playing on the computer, just, just do yourself a favor really quickly. Just go to your key bindings for me. Go to options. Go to key bindings. And uh, change backpack from I for inventory to B for backpack. Just do it. Don't ask questions. Thank me later. Once you've got that set up, <laughs> you don't have to. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nice help. We actually have three bottles of antiseptic, so we might have started with some antiseptic, and that can really weigh you down. Um, notice that we are, we're at about 40 of 66 pounds. Speaking of configuration, one more thing on, I'll note for you really quickly. You can set the game to use metric or imperial units. And I've had a lot of people ask me that are newer to the game and not quite sure what they're looking at. Um, maybe they're more used to the metric system because the game defaults to the metric system. But depending on where you live, I live in the States and, you know, we don't use the metric system and there's a few other places that use the imperial system. There's not many, but, but we use it. And, um, it's just, so I have Fahrenheit instead of Celsius and 
pounds instead of kilograms, um, gallons instead of liters, stuff like that. Um, and it can be confusing because people will, will see this and they'll see, Hey, how do you get 66 carrying capacity? I only have 30. It's, and they, they think, Oh, okay, well he's improved his carrying capacity. There are now ways that are brand new to the latest update in the game to increase your carrying capacity, but it's not an increased carrying capacity. It's just a different unit. So 66 pounds, 30 kilograms, same thing. The, the numbers are a lot more round in the lawn dark when you play with a metric system. I will say that, but if you're more comfortable with a given unit of distance or weight, or what have you, then you can switch, you know, between you can switch to whichever one you are most comfortable with. So that being said, um, let's take a look at the inventory system. We again, are, we're about two thirds of the way full still can scavenge anything I want. Notice that everything is categorized by those icons I was pointing out earlier. So anything you pick up with a tool icon will go in this category, anything you pick up with a clothing icon, obviously will go in the clothing category. Uh, and then of course, uh, the first aid category, fire starting, food and drink material, etc. So, and there's the all category. You can also sort your inventory by alphabetical order or by condition. And you can sort both ways, of course. So you just click the button twice as many times as you want to reverse the sort. This can be youth useful, for instance, when you're repairing your clothing and you want to repair the items that need it most first, which is a good strategy most of the time, but sometimes you might want to repair the items that are going to give you the biggest single boost to your warmth and to your wind protection first. Maybe you want to do that. So, you know, th there are some different strategies there, which we will discuss, but you can sort by condition if you like. And then finally, you have the sort by weight, which is really, really good once you are doing some inventory management and you have to think, oh God, what are the heavy things that I'm carrying? What, what are the biggest single items that I can drop? Um, and of course, you, you do have to think also in terms of reversing the order here and thinking about what are the smallest items I'm carrying that are really adding up, you know, you know, they'll never stack because they're the small items. But when you look at like, for instance, right here, this is almost a pound right here. This is just shy of a pound. This is pretty much a pound. It's 0.99, right? Um, actually, no, this is 0.77. So it's, it's three fourths of a pound. So point is, it's good to, you know, be able to sort by weight when you need to manage your inventory. So that's how these screens are sorted. And also note that it will tell you for each category, roughly how much uh, each category or not roughly, but exactly how much each category is weighing you down. So you can spot which category is the culprit before you start your inventory management and figuring out where you need to drop the most stuff right now. I'm okay. I'm completely fine, but that's how inventory works. So let me now switch to clothing and talk about uh, some of the items that I picked up and how this screen works. This screen was in the game. It's been updated a little bit. It's, it was in the game. It was brand new actually to the game when survival school first launched. But this is also one of the things you should understand first, very much like the, the tab screen that I'm looking at now, or like the, the status screen that I pulled up earlier. Um, this is another screen you should be very familiar with. You can hit the C key to pull it up very quickly. Um, and, or you can, you know, just switch to it here when you're in your inventory, just, just go over here. Um, this is your status screen. You can use these icons to switch to other things as well. We've got the, um, okay, it's going to load for a second. Always does this when the game first boots up. This is the crafting menu. And of course, the journal, which gives you lots of information. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But uh, for now, let me continue to focus on basics for this first episode, because I don't want to take too much longer uh, before we go into some new topics and new episodes. So the very first thing you should understand is that you have multiple layers that you can wear. Uh, they did add in the most recent update, which is called Rugged Sentinel. They added the ability to um, when you're wearing an item, it actually gets lighter. So let me show you an example of this. Right now, we're carrying 40 pounds, right? You saw that. But let me go ahead and put on this, these jeans. They weigh only a pound and a tenth, but let me go ahead and put them on and show you how our carrying capacity has increased. Well, our capacity hasn't increased, but the weight of what we're carrying has decreased because we put on those jeans. They weigh less once they are actually on your body's musculature and you are carrying them by wearing them which is a very nice change and I think a welcome addition because sometimes when you're wearing a lot of really nice clothing items, you, you, you just feel like your clothing is taking up an unreasonable amount of weight. So that is one nice thing. And you'll notice that when you're looking at the clothing inventory screen, it, there is actually a difference between how much your is in your pack and how much you're wearing. It tells you literally uh, the difference between the two, which is quite nice. Another thing that's very important to understand though, is that where you put your items on your body in terms of which slot you have two slots on your head 
two accessory slots, two slots on your, or sorry, four slots on your torso, two for each of the shirt and jacket category. So this is an outer layer. This is an inner layer. Hold on to that idea of layering because there's a whole nother layer to that layer. <laughs> and then of course there's the outer layer for pants. There's the inner layer for things like thermal underwear. And when we find long johns, uh, there's two layers of socks, one layer of shoes, one layer for mittens or gloves or what have you. So I said that there was another layer to the layer. What I meant by that cheeky comment is that stuff that's on the inside here, closer to your character, is actually the inner layer of clothing as well. And what you put there not only matters, but sometimes can be limited by what you're wearing in the other slots. So understand that if you're wearing something, um, like let's say I was not wearing this light shell. Because I'm wearing this light shell, the only wind protection that matters is the light shell's wind protection. Every clothing item has these indicators. And we might talk more about this later because I'm mainly focused on the clothing screen right now. But you've got warmth protection, which is shown right here, the warmth bonus. You have your wind protection. You have your uh, elements protection. So it basically protects you from, you know, how, it's how absorptive it is or not um, when you're out, say, in a blizzard, which you can get very wet and things can even get frozen when you are out in that kind of weather. So you have to be quite careful. And then, of course, there's the uh, the actual armor, the protection of the item that is afforded uh, by wearing it. So uh, the more protection you have on in that sense, uh, you can actually uh, lose less condition in a struggle with a wolf or a bear because your clothing is thicker and hardier and it's harder for those animals to get through your outer layers and actually bite you and hurt you. And then finally, um, clothes can also restrict your movement a little bit. So uh, right now we have a 93% sprint capacity between all of our items because our worn leather shoes are bringing us down by 3%. Our light shell is bringing us down by 2%. And we're wearing something else that's dragging us down. Oh yeah, the jeans are each 1%. So what that means, I'll show you very quickly, and we'll talk more about this probably at a later point. If I hold down shift, which is the run key, I'm not going to run anywhere, but if I hold down shift, you can see my stamina meter has a red chunk in it there. That is how much I will not be able to fully take advantage of my sprint meter because of this stuff that I'm wearing. So if you have some nice thick clothing that's warm and protects you from the elements, that's wonderful, but it might be more restrictive and you'll find yourself less able to sprint. And you'll actually also notice it, it, it really does slow down your sprint speed a little bit as well. So you have to be mindful of that too. So all that being said, let me actually show you what I was talking about when it comes to the layer so that you really know where I'm coming from. For, coming from. Excuse me. First of all, let's go ahead and put on... I think for now, I'm going to go ahead and put on... The, oh, wow. See, look how restrictive of movement the insulated boots are. They're amazing boots, and they're not even at full condition. They're 44% condition, and they're that much better than the leather shoes that I'm wearing. Look at that. 2.3 and 1.6 in wind protection. Amazing, right? But they're so restrictive of movement versus the trail boots, which are less restrictive of movement and still pretty damn good compared to what I'm wearing right now. I am going to go ahead and put on the insulated boots for now but I'm going to hold on to these. We'll probably get rid of those in a bit, but I'm not going to do any harvesting this episode. So we've got this thin wool sweater on. Again, it matters what you have on the innermost layer. Right now it doesn't because I'm wearing an outer layer. I've got the light shell on, but I still am going to think in terms of that for the purposes of this moment. So it actually looks like the thick wool sweater is the better item to have on the outer layer. I'm looking at comparing these two right now. It's got the better wind protection, uh, it's also provides me a good amount of warmth protection as well. So that's nice that we found a thick wool sweater right off the bat. Uh, let's go ahead and put the better condition of the two toques on my outermost layer here. And we'll eventually repair these to where they'll be the same condition and it won't matter. But that's a great find there. And now we're set. Notice that we now have a 16 and 7 warmth and windproof bonus, whereas before we had a what? Hang on, let's take all that stuff off and look. Nine and five. So some pretty big upgrades, right? And we had that extra pair of jeans too that I forgot to take off. Oh, I dropped that stuff by accident. All right, so there's all that. And there's another toque on the ground somewhere. Where are you? Where are you, toque? I know you're there. Come on, got to feel around in the dark for the toque that I dropped. Really? Hang on. Normally I would never recommend this. Setting a terrible example. There's the toque. You want to be very careful with matches, especially in the later game, in the long dark. Uh, really, at any point in the game, you want to be careful with matches. But um, actually, what I mean to say is in higher difficulty levels, where, where they're harder to come by, you want to be um, a conservationist with your matches. But I was annoyed that I accidentally dropped the unit or dropped the clothing item there 
as opposed to taking it off. So I used a match to see what I was doing. <laughs> do, do as I say, not as I do in this particular instance. But let's go ahead and put these clothing items back on and we will get ready to go back outside. So that's an introduction to the clothing interface. Again, you want to make sure that all of your items are in good condition as well. And we're going to talk about how to repair them in a future episode. But that is what I'm going to end with for this particular episode, because I think that's a good introduction to the basic interfaces of the game. And it kind of gives you an introduction to me as well, if you are new to the channel and just here for the first time. So I'm stepping outside just to get a view for things. Oh, you know what? I'll give you one quick little pointer. Before I end the episode here, um, hopefully you, I didn't already have people tune out a second ago when I said I'm going to end the episode, but so I might mention this in a future episode as well, but these crows here, notice they're circling. This isn't just a prop of the environment. This is not just a coincidence. This isn't just the game making things look pretty or giving you some sense of atmospheric immersion by having crows randomly circling. Crows in this game are carrying crows and they will circle corpses uh, from the, and, and you can see them from afar. So they will indicate the presence of a dead body. We of course already know there's a dead body here, but that's why those crows are there. They will also drop, hang on, as they fly around, let me guess, are they on the roof? Hmm, no. Well, I don't see them, but typically they drop crow feathers. Sometimes when there's a building in the way like this, they can they can hide from you. They can be a little bit tougher to find. But uh, the crow feathers can be useful later on for crafting certain uh, very, very useful items once you run out of uh, certain very, very useful man-made items. So there's, uh, or I should say manufactured items, really. But crows are always an indicator that there is some kind of dead thing, whether it's an animal or a human, that can be scavenged, usually, in some way. And that's a good indicator to have. But I'm going to create a save point for myself here. And again, we're going to stop with this one. Uh, in the next one, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, uh, well, I think what I want to do with each episode is what kind of ended up happening much kind of by accident in the original survival school is I had two topics per video that I covered in the title that, that were mentioned in the title. And that wasn't always the case, but a lot of the episodes had two topics. And one topic was always kind of planned and always one was kind of emergent. So tell you what, as you watch this particular episode, if you want to see something from episode two or three or four, sometimes I record these in chunks, so I won't always be able to respond to some feedback for the next episode, but uh, using comments from the previous episode, but uh, go ahead and just let me know what you would like to see as far as one of the next basics to cover in the second episode. But I will say for my planned topic, I want, I want to kind of have a planned topic and um, an emergent topic, really, for each video. So we have that two-topic approach. Uh, for my plan topic, I want to talk probably a little bit about fire starting uh, in the next episode. That'll at least be in episode two or three, I think. Uh, but also, we're going to talk about some of the um, wildlife in the game and also some of the different... Uh, places, uh, some of the different items you can scavenge in the world apart from what we've already found, uh, because we still are in kind of an outward location in Mystery Lake. So we're going to have to do some moving around and exploration to find um, some other items. And we might find some additional lighting items, some, some stuff that makes it easier to get around at night. Uh, we might find um, some things that uh, will let me talk about the crafting system in the game. I might even spend a little bit of time next episode just talking about the journal and the rest of this screen that, that I started talking about this episode. And also maybe the map, which I haven't talked about too much yet. And I don't even use that much in my own playthroughs of The Long Dark. But anyway, I will go ahead and stop this episode here. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this one, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to follow along. New episodes are going to be coming out every day at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Comments are always welcome. Let me know what you think, and I will see you next time.